Hi everyone. Previously, we discussed the frequency response of a cascode amplifier. We said that when we analyze the cascode amplifier as a cascade of two single stage amplifiers, which is a common source and a common gate amplifiers, we said that the dominant pole actually occurs at the output of the first stage, which is nothing but the intermediate node voltage VO1 shown here. Now this is contrary to the popular belief where the dominant pole actually occurs at the output node. In the analysis, we also showed that the first stage actually happens to have a zero at 1 by CL or not. And we approximated the gain at the high frequencies to be very close to 1 or 0 decibels. In the second stage, we said it's, it has only one pole and that pole happens to be at the zero of the first stage. Now to get the overall gain, I just have to multiply the gain of the first and the second stages. So that gives me a frequency response that looks like this. And this is a frequency response of a standard cascode amplifier. We have just one large load capacitor at the output. So it's we just expect, to, expect the amplifier to just have one pole, which is at 1 by CL J mod naught square and the DC gain which is GM or not the whole square approximately. But what we discussed in the previous lecture is that the dominant pole actually occurs at the output of the first stage. So that's what we will be now trying to validate these results through simulations. We will look at the frequency response of this intermediate node and the frequency response of the overall cascode amplifier and we will show uh, the occurrence of the zero and all that. To simulate this, I have used a test bench which is shown here and these MOS devices are from 180 nanometer CMOS process, UMC 180 nanometer CMOS process and the value of these bias resistors RB is close to 100 mega ohms and the value of the capacitor is 1 millifarad. The capacitor is really unreasonably large, but I chose so that uh, they don't interfere with the simulation results. So at the frequencies of interest, these capacitors will look like short circuit, these two capacitors. And the load capacitance is chosen to be 10 picofarad. Now I've chosen a large load capacitor um, and for, the, for this simulation, uh, the maximum device capacitors uh, the parasitic capacitors is in the order of tens of femtofarads. So uh, we, we emulated a situation where we can ignore all the other capacitors. So the system will look like as though it has just one dominant capacitor at the output node. And I've also discussed the reasoning for why did we choose a test bench like this wherein we connect a resistance between gate and drain. Okay. So uh, there is a reasoning why we chose RB as 100 mega ohms. I'll very very briefly discuss that, but I'd recommend you to watch the previous videos on uh, simulating uh, single stage uh, MOS amplifiers. So shown here are two arrangements by which uh, we can run a AC analysis. So here I'm showing this example through a common source amplifier. It's, the idea is very similar to a cascode amplifier as well. So here the goal is to have a current biased common source amplifier. So the current is fixed. So even if your process changes, the current is always fixed. So in a typical current biased a common source amplifier, if I want to bias it, then I'll do a DC simulation and figure out what is the VGS required and then apply that as a DC voltage and I can apply the AC voltage in series with it. The problem with this approach is that we know that in saturation region, a MOS device behaves like a current source. So that's like putting two current sources in series. And so the, the voltage at this point is undefined. So which means your VDS squeezant is not really defined by this way. So here I've shown it on an ID versus VDS graph. So for a range of values of VDS, the ID is same. Okay, so if I ignore or not, so I can say that you know for a range of values of VDS, the drain current is going to remain the same. So which means here, VDS can be anything, I mean anything in, in this range. So it's not really defined. So when you actually simulate it, uh, the graph, the ID versus VDS graph will have a finite slope in this region. 
so which means for a unique drain current there is a unique vds quiescent uh, uh, quiescent operating point a drain to source voltage but then when even when you are tweaking the dimensions of this device slightly you will actually suddenly see some unreasonable changes at the output so which is why the first method th th this is not the right way to bias it so here i'm talking about current biasing so where your current is fixed it's 1 milliampere and again the second way is also not the good way to bias here so the only difference between the second circuit is in how you couple the signal couple the ac signal here the ac signal is coupled through a capacitor c so at the frequencies of interest the capacitor will behave like a short circuit so you can see that for as far as the ac signal is concerned the input signal is concerned the input of the circuit will look like a high pass filter and the cutoff of this high pass filter will be at 1 by rbc so you have to ensure that this cutoff of this high pass filter is at 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 really a low frequency so where your uh, the frequencies over which you are running the simulation the pole should be the pole should have occurred at a much lower frequency so which means your capacitor will look like a short circuit at those frequencies of interest so but then the first two approaches are not suited especially i mean when we are going to do a current biasing the first two approaches cannot be used so therefore we said the third approach wherein we connect a resistor rb between the drain and the gate terminals this helps us in defining a proper dc quiescent operating point so because the at dc there is no current flowing through rb so vgsq will be forced to be equal to vdsq now this dc current idc sets vgsq so of course once you define your w well values for this mos device then vgs quiescent is set the only problem with this approach is in ac analysis now this capacitor again can be chosen so that you know it behaves like a short circuit at the frequencies of interest so i'll assume it's a short compared to a conventional common source amplifier there is one additional path through rb to the output now if i can somehow kill or reduce the current that's flowing through rb to the output node then i don't really have to worry about uh, the value of rb interfering with the simulations now how do i choose rb so if the the impedance looking into the drain terminal let's call that as r out if you ensure that your rb is much much greater than r out then we can say that the current that is flowing through rb can be neglected okay so rb will look like an open circuit for all practical purposes so the condition that we have to satisfy is your rb has to be much greater than r out so for this common source amplifier your r out happens to be uh, r not itself so your rb has to be much greater than r not the problem with this test bench is that vgsq is forced to be equal to vdsq that's the only problem with this and that can also be resolved by just adding a voltage vx in series with rb as shown in this circuit so at dc the vds squeezent will simply be equal to vx plus vgsq so now uh, we can independently tweak vds by varying vx so here uh, in this setup we can actually have different vgs and vds but for this simulation i have not used a vx so i have just used this resistor rb here and i have chosen rb as 100 mega ohms in this simulation and we will later see the r out in this circuit for a cascode amplifier the r out happens to be for this uh, in this circuit for a drain current of 1 milliampere and the r out is around 3 kilo ohms and if i multiply that by gm or not so the output resistance of a cascode is gm or not square gmr not happens to be around 20 so you get it at 60k so your r out is still less than 100k so i have chosen rb as 100 mega ohm so which is 1000 times larger than r out so which means that's not going to interfere with your uh, dc gain values so that's it i'll now start discussing the simulation results so for ac as far as ac is concerned uh, the capacitors the coupling capacitors and the bypass capacitors will all look like a short circuit so the circuit will just reduce to something like this 
So the W bell sizes for these devices is 1 micron by 180 nanometers and uh, with the fingers of 20. The GMOR ID for these MOS devices is close to 6.7 6, 6 to 7 and I could have pushed it to a higher value but this was sufficient uh, because in this simulation I have assumed this current source to be an ideal current source which is the current source which is feeding the ca cas code amplifier as shown here this current source here so I didn't have to worry about uh, a voltage headroom for the, bi the bias current so I could uh, live with this GM over ID ratio and th these are the DC operating parameters so we I mean I obtained this results from a DC simulation the GM of this first device is 6.7 and GDS which is 1 by R0 is 0.35 again milliampere per volt for the second device however in the simulation uh, the bulk terminal is actually connected to ground the source and bulk are not shorted so i have also reported gmb for it so gm and gds are very very close because the bulk is not uh, shorted to source the vt is different and the vgs is also different so you get a slightly different gm and gds very very slight change now because I haven't uh, included GMB in the previous analysis. So what you need to do is that you have to just add your GM to GM, GMB to GM. Okay, especially the, the GMB occurs only in the second device. So wherever you get GM2, you just have to add GMB to it and you all the expressions are changed. That's the only change you'll have to make. So I have shown here the calculations for poles and zeros. Uh, the dominant pole or the first stage pole is 244 kilohertz from calculations. That is 1 by 2 pi CL uh, into GM or not square. I have used an exact expression here. Okay. In fact, I have not shown here. So this is actually GM plus GMB. Then uh, you get a value of around 244 kilohertz. And the first stage zero should occur at 1 by CL or not, which is 5.6 megahertz. So this is what we predict. And what we see in the simulation result is, a, is very much as what we, what we actually uh, analyzed in the previous lecture. So this is the stage one gain, which is a common source stage. You can see that the DC gain is close to uh, the GM is 6.7 by 0.3 so you it's it's close to 20 very close to 20 so 20 log of 20 is again the gain is reported in decibels so it's 26 db so it's 25.6 at 25.7 here it's not exactly 20 so that's why you see that difference and the pole so we just moved 3 db from the dc gain and we get it as at, at the pole is at 240 kilohertz and the zero happens to be at 5.7 megahertz so to measure the zero we just move 3 db above the constant value, the steady state value and then uh, locate the zero and that comes to around 5.7 megahertz and the high frequency gain we said from the previous analysis was one and that's supposed to be at zero decibels but here we are actually getting it at minus 1.72 i'll discuss why is that very very in a few moments i'll discuss that so, but what we are trying to say here is that this is exactly in correlation with what we discussed in the previous lecture. And we can also see the locations of the poles and zeros are matching within, you know, with, with an error of 2 to 3 percent. Now, I'll talk about why is this gain not 0 decibels, but instead it's minus 1.72. So, if you recall, in the previous lecture, we said that uh, the first stage gain when we analyzed it I said at high frequency the capacitor is going to behave like a short circuit so then the load offered by the second stage is going to be 1 by gm so that's why we said the gain is approximately 1 by uh, gm by 1 by gm it's 1 but actually if you take into account uh, the body effect and the GDS so you'll actually have R not 1 R not 2 and 1 by gm plus gmp2 so you'll have to include the body effect as well so when you include all of that the dc gain or the high frequency gain happens to be gm1 by 
the sum of all the other transconductors, which is GM2 plus GMB2 plus GDS1 plus GDS2. And that happens to be minus 1.75 dB. So that's why we see uh, minus 1.75 dB instead of 0 decibels here. Now for this, this is the frequency response of the overall amplifier. Now as you can see, there is no pole, uh, there is no uh, zero in this. So that which, which means that the zero in the first stage is cancelled out by the pole in the second stage. And we can see the dominant pole occurs at 240 kilohertz, which was same as the dominant pole of the first stage. And the overall DC gain is roughly twice. So the first stage gain was around 26 dB. So it's around 52 is the overall gain. In fact, you can exactly calculate and match all these values within, you know, with an error of just less than 2%. Okay. But we can easily see that the first stage gain was close to 26. So the second stage gain and the overall gain should be twice of that in decibels. So it's, it's around 52 decibels. And you just have one pole here. Now I have overlaid both the transfer functions. So which is the... Uh, the overall transfer function or the overall gain and the gain of the first stage or uh, the voltage at the intermediate node. Now you can see that the dominant pole is same and the zero which had occurred at 5.7 megahertz is absent here. So which means that zero is actually getting cancelled by the second stage pole. And here we can see the gain is flattening out because of the zero for the first stage but this the overall amplifier uh, frequency response just rolls off with a slope of 20 decibels per decade as though it has just one pole at 240 kilohertz. So uh, that's it about this lecture. Uh, the main goal was to verify what we discussed in the previous lecture uh, through simulations.